I want to welcome our viewers back to Conversations with the President. My guest this week is none other than Associate General Minister, the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson. Karen Georgia, welcome. And why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself? Well, I have now been serving for uh, about eight months as the Associate General Minister for uh, wider church ministries. So um, with um, responsibilities for global ministries, which I serve as a co-executive um, with uh, Julia Brown Karimu from the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Uh, the, I have been a national uh, setting employee since 2009. <laughs> when I started as the Minister for Racial Justice. And so this is my third iteration in the national setting and, um, you know, still working into what it means to hold this role in the national setting amidst, um, it seems like, um, uh, ongoing changes every other week, including um, COVID-19, right? So let's talk about that. Uh, you and I talk almost every day. Every day. Sometimes in different parts of the world. Yes. And uh, uh, two and a half weeks ago on a Friday night, my phone rang about 11 o'clock. You were on the phone. And uh, tell me about, tell our viewers about that conversation. And then let's talk about the last two weeks. Yeah. So um, it was March 20th and we had just gone through um, getting our staff fully deployed and sent home and um, First day of full deployment. Yes, it was. And so I had been in the office for most of the day, um, left and went home and my refrigerator was full of all the things that it was supposed to have because I was going to be working from home. And I got a call from my sister saying that my father was not, he had not gotten up during the course of the day. It was, uh, mid-afternoon when I was driving home. And so by six o'clock, we made the decision that we, um, he needed to go to the hospital. It was clear to me based on my attempts to talk with him on WhatsApp video, she held the phone. I tried talking with him. He never opened his eyes for the 10 minute conversation that I had with him. Um, the entire time he was just kind of curled in a fetal position. He would respond to me, but it was clear to me that he was also having some trouble breathing. So she called the ambulance and the ambulance came a little after, after six. I think I probably called you maybe about seven, 7.30. First call, and, yes. Yeah, the first, that was the first call. Right. Um, uh, and I, 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 I thank you for taking that call because um, you helped me to think through what it was that I needed to do. And um, I made the decision that I was, I was going to drive to New York that night. Um, we talked through um, what the challenges were. Um, at that time, uh, we weren't sure what was wrong. Um, was 85 years old. And... Um, I had spoken to him that Sunday and I told him that he couldn't leave the house anymore. 85, you can't leave the house, you need to stay home. This is, um, you know, he was a vulnerable population. Yeah. Uh, after we spoke, um, I took, fielded a call from the, from the hospital. Right. And at that time they wanted to, um, they wanted to intubate him and I told him, told them that he, um, he was a DNI, which was one of the things that you and I had discussed on the phone was that my father um, had a DNI, he was DNI, DNR. And so as his health proxy, a part of my processing at that point was thinking through, well, the what if scenarios, which is some of what we discussed on the phone about, um, decisions that would eventually need to be made if he were really um, as sick as he appeared to be. So I took the, the second call from the hospital and they said they wanted to intubate. I said, he's DNI. 
they said, well, we need to, they needed to make a decision about what was going to happen with him. And um, at that point, I said, DNI, they said, well, they would give him medication. So um, I threw some things into a bag, <laughs> threw some clothes still on the hanger, into the, into the hangers, into the back of my car and went to the gas station closest to my house, filled my tank, my gas tank, and got on the road and called you a second time. Or maybe by that time it was the third phone call. <laughs> yeah, and I told you that I was on the road. Um, I was on the Ohio Turnpike. It was 9.30 at night. And I just drove through the night. Um, on the way into New York, um, I, I have a half sister who lives in Philadelphia. I called her and I told her that our father was not well. And she said, well, she was gonna get up the next morning and she was gonna take the bus into New York from Philadelphia. And I told her, I said, you don't wanna get on a bus. Mm into New York from Philadelphia. You don't know who's going to be on the bus. I said, and at that point, I was on the eastern side of Pennsylvania. I told her, I said, I'm going to pull over. Give me your address. So she gave me her address. I put it in my GPS. And my GPS indicated that I would be at her house at 4 o'clock in the morning. I said, I'm going to be at your house at 4 o'clock. Get ready to go. She said, I'm going to get some sleep. I'll throw some stuff in a bag. So I went through Philadelphia and picked her up at 4 a.m., my, oh my. On that Saturday morning, what um, the on the way into New York, I went across the Ohio Turnpike into Pennsylvania, got on the Pennsylvania Turnpike into Philadelphia, left Philadelphia on the New Jersey Turnpike. Three turnpikes, three states. There were no rest areas open. Oh my! No service areas open very little traffic. It was the most surreal driving experience I have ever had. I mean, and that's when it started to hit me, the enormity of what was actually going on in the world, that there, there, were, there were no service areas. Everything was closed. There was no place to use the bathroom, no place to stop to get gas unless you got off on an exit. Mm -hmm. But I drove the seven hours into, into Philadelphia and um, on the way out of Philly on the New Jersey Turnpike, my sister called me. And at that point, it was about 5 a.m. and the hospital had called her and asked her to come back. And she, when she went, they told her that our father had passed. So he died at 4.34 a.m. on that Saturday morning. I was on the New Jersey Turnpike, so I drove straight to the hospital. He was, he was already dead. Um, so I had the opportunity just to pray with my, my, uh, my sisters and my brother. Um, and I was glad that I, I did take the opportunity in that moment to, um, to pray with them. Yeah. And to um, to actually perform what ended up being the last rites over his body, because um, in the weeks to come, uh, one, um, it took them about four days to notify us that uh, he was COVID positive, which was which was hard because by the time we learned that he was COVID positive, three of us were already sick. Uh, and they called to tell us, they actually called his cell phone to notify him that he was COVID positive. Wow. So my sister told them that he had died on that Saturday. So the people who are performing the tests are separate from the hospital. So they have no idea what the condition of the patients are that they're testing. So, um, so, so that was challenging. We had already made a decision that we were gonna self-isolate when we left the hospital. Um, it, was, uh, it was a decision that we made collectively and we felt it was the most responsible thing to do because we had no idea what, um, what his situation was, what, um, what his cause of death was. 
So we decided that we were just going to stay. We were going to stay in the house until we learn differently. Um, and so when we started, um, my nephew was the first one who got sick. He's in his 30s. He's asthmatic. Um, he was sick for almost three weeks. So we're, we're in our, um, our third week of um, being isolated, uh, third week of being sick. We've all run the full gamut of symptoms. My sister is the only one who's gotten tested. My sister is a New York City police officer, so she's an essential employee. So um, after her second week out, they um, sent her to get tested. It took her five hours to get tested, um, which was very hard um, physically because by the time she got back, the only thing she could do was get in her bed and she just coughed for hours because it was just so physically taxing uh, for her. So it's been, um, it's been different. We've, um, we're in the house. I, I, I saw my nephew yesterday for the first time in three weeks. Um, he actually lives downstairs in the, we're all in the same building, just in different parts of the, of the building. So I hadn't seen him in weeks, he is doing a lot better, still fatigued. Um, and having, um, he feels he's well enough to go back to work. He cannot get a doctor's note because you can't get in to see a doctor in New York City. So there is no way for him to get cleared to, um, to go back to work. And I think that these are um, some of the challenges that are not quite expressed around um, the experiences that individuals are having around um, whether it's essential employees who have to go to work or people who still need childcare because they have to go to work or people who need to go to work but they can't find a doctor to get to work because they're not sick. Um, also the challenges around being just sick to um, um, I went through days where I could not stand up. Um, walking was challenging. Um, I think my my low moment was the day that I fell in the t fell into the tub oh, because no. I didn't have enough energy to sit on the side of the tub, so I fell into the tub. And it took me. My sister came running. She said, "Do you?" She said, "Can I help you?" And I said. I said, no, I'm just going to lay here for a while. Mm. And I just, I just took my two legs into the tub and I just, I just laid in the tub on my back for 10 minutes because I was too exhausted to get out the tub. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, I, and I had hit my head going down and I just thought to myself, like, how are people managing? Yeah. You know, elderly people, um, you know, persons with disabilities, people who are taking care of themselves and their children. So it, it's, it's been a huge eye opener, just from a personal experience, but also just from uh, a place of, of thinking through and, and, and what are we doing? How can we be helpful to, um, to all these folks who are out there who are just having a really challenging time? So I, I want to ask you about something else, if you don't mind talking about it. Five days ago, uh, they buried your father. Yes. You mentioned a moment ago, you were glad you had that time of prayer with your family uh, when he actually, when you first saw him in the hospital after he had died, because that was his last rites. Yes. Um, one of the phenomenon, and you now know this, is loved ones are dying and funerals can't be held. And there's that moment of closure is missed. And, yes. and that's such an important part of the grief process. You sent me some video of what actually happened at your dad's yes. burial. It looked like something that was shot on the moon, you know, in some, you know, cheap uh, sci-fi film that you see at two in the morning. Describe that experience for our viewers, if you would. We, um, so like many places, you're only allowed a maximum of 10 people for a 
funeral. Um, I had done um, my mother's funeral and I knew that was my father's expectation as well. So um, one, um, we made a decision, my, my siblings and I, that um, it would make sense to have a graveside service. Um, one, um, we had been isolated for two weeks, but we don't know. Um, we don't know what our, we didn't know what our situation was. Um, and so they gave us that Friday for his funeral. I spoke with the funeral home on Thursday afternoon to um, confirm with them that we could have a graveside service for him. Um, they confirmed that, um, yes, we could have that. They could not do backfill, meaning they could not fill the grave while we were present um, out of concern for their employees. He was scheduled for one o'clock um, on, on uh, last week, Friday, um, which would have been almost two weeks after he had passed. We got out to the, to the cemetery um, and we were told at that point that we needed to stay a minimum of a hundred feet from the grave. So um, you, you're communicating through um, a funeral director because you really can't go inside, right? Um, so he kept going back and forth um, into the cemetery office and finally came out and said they would not allow us to be closer than 100 feet. So I said, well, I said, he hasn't had last rites. I said, um, he, um, we, we haven't done a funeral for him. So we left from the office, we were escorted. So there was the hearse, um, my brother, my sister and I were in a, in a car. Um, there was um, a car from the funeral home. So really it was a four car party that basically went to the gravesite. When we got to the gravesite, they said um, the staff would not come out as long as we were out of the car. And I still had the same concerns. They said, well, if you want to, you could do something while his body is still in the hearse. I said, well, that's not reasonable. Um, they said, well, that's the best they could do because they weren't allowed to take the, um, the casket out of the hearse without the, the cemetery staff being present. So um, out of nowhere, and we were the only people on that side of the cemetery. It was raining, it was foggy, which only added to the surreal nature of the experience, right? Um, we got back in the car because we saw four cars coming, four vehicles. Um, they, the four vehicles pulled up, four people came out. They were wearing full hazmat suits. They were covered from head to toe. Um, they went to the, went to the, uh, to the hearse. They walked the body to, um, a golf cart, essentially drove the car over the uh, cart over, um, and at that point, they uncovered the the, the plot, put the uh, put the the casket down, put him into the ground. It was all of like five minutes, and he was he was gone. And it it was challenging because then we found ourselves needing to explain to the family what had happened because they couldn't, I had gotten on FaceTime on my phone and when they got into, when they, when they came on, um, the ones who did make it on, they're like, what's going on? We're like, they're burying him. They're like, what do you mean? We're like, they're putting, like, they're putting him in the ground. They turn around, they walked away and we're sitting in the cemetery with five or six people on the phone going, what happened? Like, did we miss it? No, you didn't miss anything. Nothing happened. So um, at this point, um, I was then thankful that I had had the opportunity to pray with him in the hospital 
because um, he was essentially buried with without a funeral, uh, no last rites. Um, his body just put into the ground, and there wasn't a whole lot that we could do about that in in that moment. So um, I'm I'm planning after Easter to do a Zoom um, service for him with the family. Yeah. Um, to offer them an opportunity, us an opportunity to um, to to have, I think, a moment of closure, and I think that will be important. So, two things before we end here, I just want to say to you: uh, your father got to see you elected at General Synod. He did, <laughs> and what a proud moment for him! It was. <laughs> he had a good time. Beaming the whole time. Yes. The second thing is you talked about um, you were his uh, medical um, proxy. Um, I, aging parents do that with the child they know will honor their wishes, regardless of their own emotions around the decision. And mm -hmm. we, we talked a little bit about that night when you called. Yes. Um, you've, you were a good daughter. You are a good daughter. He was a proud Thank father. You. I know you miss him. And yes. um, you so much because of this virus, um, not just your father, but so much that accompanies good grief has been taken from you as yeah. you've, you suffered from the virus. Um, we all read reports. We see statistics and data about this, but you've walked us through a very personal account of what the virus has done. And I just want to Thank you for being so vulnerable with us. I, I want to thank you for um, taking some time with our listeners to share your experience. Um, and thank you for your continued and ongoing service as an officer of the United Church of Christ. The thank Reverend you. Yeah. And I would just say, um, be safe. Yeah. Be smart. Whatever it be takes. Be safe. Um, and, and realize that the choices that you make, you make not only for yourself, but you're making for hundreds of others that you will come in contact with. And thank you for the opportunity. You're for welcome. Conversation. You're thank welcome. You. I want to thank our viewers for tuning in again. We'll be back. This has been Conversations with John. Thank you for listening. <laughs>